All right, so thanks for joining us today. My name is Vinicius and I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft focusing on containers and Kubernetes. And today I'm joined by Tyler from the Turn 10 Studios. So Tyler, thanks for joining us today. No problem, glad to be here. Awesome, so you wanna introduce yourself? People probably know you from the customer story that was published about the fours of five, but please introduce yourself in your own words. Sure. So I'm a principal software engineering lead over at Turn 10 Studios. Um, I help build and maintain and run all the cloud services that power uh, all of our Forza Horizon and our Forza Motorsport games. Um, been at Turn 10 Studios for about eight years and Microsoft for about 19 years. Uh, and that, that's me. Wow. That's, a, that's a long time. I've been at Microsoft for almost 11 and uh, I can imagine how uh, 19 years must feel like. <laughs> it's flown by. <laughs> yes, I, I can I can see that. So, all right, so let's talk about Forza, right? So uh, Forza, the customer store was published on the public website. You guys are running on AKS, on Windows containers. So let's talk a little bit about the history first. So what was the state of Forza prior to AKS? And what made you guys choose uh, uh, AKS and continuing on the Windows platform? Sure. So when I joined the team, uh, we were actually running on-prem services, uh, talking to an on-prem SQL database. Uh, and as our games continue to grow and become bigger uh, and have larger audiences, uh, that just really, we, we weren't able to continue to maintain the services in that fashion. So uh, a few years back, we migrated over to Azure Cloud Services. Uh, that definitely had some benefits over the on-prem uh, solution. Uh, we're able to have elastic scalability and scale up and down. Um, given our right around our launch windows and holidays, we have humongous peaks of users. Uh, and then that dies down a little bit uh, in between those periods. Um, and so previously, we'd have all this hardware for the that launch, and then it, we'd still have to pay for it and maintain it, but it wouldn't really be used in between launch and holiday. Uh, and so moving to cloud services helped us out a lot. Um, and But we really wanted to be on a, a modern, future-looking platform, uh, and cloud services is just not that anymore. Uh, and so, I guess, what, early last year, we started looking around to see what's kind of out there. Uh, we were looking at Azure Service Fabric for a little bit, um, and then Azure Kubernetes. And just given our time frame of where we were at with uh, the different titles we were working on and different deadlines, uh, we really landed on Azure Kubernetes as, as the solution for us. It seemed kind of natural, uh, just the large community base um, around it. At the time, we weren't even positive whether that meant we had to go to Linux because that is the larger community. Um, but as we investigated it, we found that uh, we really wouldn't have to change that much of our logic uh, if we went to Windows containers on AKS. Um, and so, being able to stay on Windows and stay on .NET Framework, running in IIS, uh, everything that we had been using for the forever, um, it really allowed our transition to, to happen very fast uh, and able to get it all up and running and stress it and feel comfortable about it before our Forza Horizon 5 launched last year. Yeah. So the team has a lot, had a lot of knowledge on Windows already and running on the cloud services. So. Uh, you wanted to continue that knowledge and then if you had to learn something new it was the kubernetes portion of that right yeah exactly our, our team was very new to uh kubernetes and docker uh so we had a lot of ramp up there um you know if we had to move to .NET core or move to linux or or pick up something else it probably wouldn't have fit in that time frame um, but the fact that we're able to reuse a lot of what we already knew and just learn those portions around docker and kubernetes uh, it allowed us to to really move fast yeah so I was going to actually ask, what were the challenges in moving to the AKS platform? Uh, I'm assuming that uh, learning curve of Kubernetes was already something uh, that the team saw as a challenge, right? Yeah, I mean, just the going from cloud services where it kind of packaged it all up for us. Um, and, you know, it was just one single package. Uh, whereas now as Kubernetes, you know, it's extremely more powerful, but with power comes a little more responsibility and <laughs> just learning those differences between services and deployments and pods and nodes and config maps. Um, you know, it's a little ramp up, a new, new area, new, new technology. Um, the fact that AKS is kind of built as a platform, though, we were able to build some great dev tools on top of it uh, that interacted with it that just kind of helped the team out um, to onboard to it. Uh, 
And then, you know, since we're already in Azure DevOps um, for our deployments, you know, it's, our, our deployments are still just one click in ADO. Um, we just had to rework how that release pipeline worked a little bit. Um, and so we were able to reuse a lot of the technology we already knew uh, and, and just kind of switch out that platform. Great. So uh, you, you touched on something that is actually true for a lot of our customers, right? Uh, which is the seasonality of how many users you have using your services. So if it's holiday, if it's a specific holiday, uh, uh, during the year, or if it's uh, the end of the year, um, they will see an increase of number of users and then it will die down uh, after that holiday or that specific date. Mm -hmm. uh, that is true for you as well. And from reading the, the customer case on the Microsoft website, we noticed that you had like a million user, users using the, the service at the same time for the launch, right? So Tell us a little bit more about the architecture and how you guys achieved that 1 million users concurrently. Yeah, so uh, Forza Horizon 5 was the first time we really, we knew it was a great game. We knew it was going to be a, a big launch. Uh, and so we set our stress goals uh, ahead of launch to be considerably higher than we'd ever done in the past. And so we actually tested to 3 million concurrent users. Um, and even just, you know, the first part, the hard part of there was to be able to simulate those 3 million concurrent users. Uh, we actually doubled down on AKS there. Uh, and wrote our, our test harness in AKS since we were able to deploy and scale up our clients, uh, which in turn would cause our services to scale up. Um, and that architecture really is spread out to 17 different microservices. Uh, and so, you know, some of the common ones that are used in our game, the most popular is leaderboards and uh, UGC, so liveries and tunes, those kinds of things, um, our drive atars, our auction house. And so all of those are kind of spread out using all different kinds of Azure storage tech. Uh, so whether it be table and blob store or SQL managed instance or Cosmos DB. Uh, and so having all of those spread out um, has helped us scale tremendously. Uh, on top of that, one of the key things that got us over that hump in stress to, to get to that 3 million uh, was using the Redis cache in Azure. Mm -hmm. uh, that allowed us to, to really kind of bypass some of the lower latency calls where needed uh, and just pull from our, our local cache. Uh, and so, yeah, all that in combination was we went into this knowing it was going to be our biggest launch ever, uh, but also probably feeling the most comfortable about any of our launches. Um, and as you said, we, we broke a million concurrent for the first time in our franchise, which was was very exciting. Uh, and at that time, all 17 microservices were, were auto scaling uh, with no intervention and, and worked great. That, that's awesome. Yeah, the auto scaling. Uh, feature on AKS uh, is something that customers take advantage uh, a lot. Uh, and just the, the peace of mind that knowing that you're going to scale up and down as the, the, uh, the load comes and goes, uh, it, it's really peace of mind for customers. But like uh, one of the things that we're really interested to hear more about is uh, it, it's a Windows platform, right? So you can cheat on Windows running on AKS. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question that customers have a lot when using uh, that approach of taking an application that already exists, moving to AKS, is how much of the architecture needs to be uh, re-architected, I'm sorry, how much of the application needs to be re-architected to uh, uh, work properly in Kubernetes and in AKS? So how, how was that experience for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we were definitely a little concerned, uh, given that we have these 17 microservices and the time frame we had, if we had to re-architect uh, you know, any of those services considerably, we, we would not have hit our deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, and in actuality, once we kind of, we migrated two of them to start uh, and wrote this playbook, uh, and then we're able to just apply that playbook across the board. And that playbook really just consisted of uh, configuration changes, some certificate changes, um, and then like how we initialize the service, so uh, how we read in that config, how we install certs. Um, and that was really the only change. Uh, I mean, in the end, we are still a full .NET Framework service running uh, in IIS on these Windows machines. Um, mm -hmm. And so not much else changed down the line, uh, which is what allowed us to move so fast. I see. So it was more like making sure that you were adopting all the uh, uh, microservices and cloud native approach of running an application rather than changing the code of the application itself, uh, essentially. Yeah, I mean, there was no business logic. I mean, even how it was hosted in IIS didn't change. Um, mm -hmm. It's really just how it started up and how we deployed it. That's awesome. Um, 
if you had like one recommendation for customers, like what, what was the main thing that you and the team learned during the process of this uh, migrating to AKS, uh, what would be that you would recommend people looking to uh, be aware of? Uh, what was the major learning for you uh, during this process? Hmm. So we ran into a, a couple issues along the way. Um, so one of them was, uh, you know, previously, our uh, our build agents uh, in ADO, we, we used Microsoft uh, hosted once, so we didn't have to worry about it. Um, and it would just do our NuGet restores and everything would work just fine. Being in the, in the Docker world, uh, every build is on a brand new container. Um, mm. And we ended up having to, to move to our own hosted agents um, in that scenario. Uh, so that way we could uh, actually use the Docker cache. Um, Without that Docker cache, we were downloading 10 gigabytes of the, the Windows image each time, and, and our builds would take too long. Uh, and so by having our own hosted agents, uh, we we're able to reuse the, um, the Docker cache and not re-download all of those images, not do NuGet restores. Um, and there's some great best practices on uh, creating those Docker files to make sure you're able to reuse as many of those layers of the image as possible. Um, wow. So that was key. Uh, using our our keep alive, uh, sorry, not keep alive, um, our our health checks uh, and our startup probes, um, just so uh, if a pod goes bad or fails to start up, we don't actually put it into rotation. So effectively mm -hmm. utilizing those and and making sure the service is healthy before it gets put into rotation. Um, yeah, yeah. Keep keeping the the image smaller. Uh, it's one of the issues that we talk to customer a lot. Customers a lot. Uh, it, it's interesting to see how you uh, approach that. Uh, Docker caches for sure something that customers leverage as well. Yep. And, and now that we are on AKS and you know we're we're on a supported platform and everything's working great, uh, it kind of opens up some more possibilities for us in the future. Uh, you know, we could move to .NET six and .NET Core. Uh, mm -hmm. and move to Windows Nano servers or even move to Linux to get smaller images and pick yeah. up some performance gains. Um, yeah. So it's not something we feel like we actually need to do because we're pretty happy with where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of just unlocks that possibility for the future. Yeah, the, the fact that you have that possibility open, it, it, it's already a give, it's already positive, yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So uh, anything final for, for our viewers, uh, anything that they should know about uh, you or the team or Forza 5, uh, maybe your avatar so they can play with you. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Hen is uh, my gamer tag. Oh, feel free to, to friend me. And uh, I'm, I try and play as a lot of Forza, Forza Horizon 5 uh, when, whenever I can. Um, I guess one, one other thing, uh, actually, it was a, a huge improvement in our dev environment. Uh, in the old world of being on cloud services, uh, every single deployment had two VMs that had to spin up for it, uh, just for mm -hmm. redundancy. Uh, and so across 17 microservices, there's you know 34 VMs already. Uh, whereas now in containers and Docker, we're able to actually stuff all those 34 pods onto just like three or four VMs. Um, so there's actually a great cost reduction uh, in our test environment. Um, and then in our production environment, we did actually play it safe and go with one pod per node uh, to start yeah. with, uh, just to keep it very similar to how our old architecture was uh, as we were still learning the environment. Um, and now we're actually able to uh, pack some more pods onto nodes and, and get even cost reduction in our production environment, which has been great. That's awesome. Yeah, these uh, playing what is the configuration you're going to use and the sizing of the VMs that are going to run your pods and how many pods you're going to use is something that uh, customers are also uh, interested in learning more about. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the recommendation, there's some guidance, of course, but usually the recommendation is play it safe. Uh, make sure you have enough for uh, supporting at least the load that you think is going to have, but then keep an eye on auto scale as well. Yep. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, I think that approach is, uh, makes a lot of sense and it's good to hear how you, how you play with that. All right, so uh, thanks a lot for your time. I think that's it for today. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Thanks Tyler for the time and we'll see you on the next video. Thanks a lot.